Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Omar. And today we're going to be talking about hierarchical modeling. Uh, before I get into it, however, let me let me just spend two minutes of introductions. So I'm, I'm a data scientist at faculty. And in case you don't know faculty, we are an artificial intelligence company. Our mission is to make artificial intelligence real. That means that we spend a lot of time doing research, working to bring artificial intelligence to your business so that it can have an impact in a positive way. And we believe that artificial intelligence should be trustworthy, impactful, and beneficial across society. And those principles have shaped our work with more than 200 organizations across public, across public and private sectors. So if you're interested in knowing how artificial intelligence can, can help you grow and accelerate your business, please don't hesitate to contact us. We'd be more than happy to chat with you. Um, OK, so with the formalities out of, out of the way, let me give you an overview of, of today's talk. I'll do my best to stick to the typical dramatic arc. So starting with, you know, hierarchical modeling is the answer, but what is the question that, what is the question? So I'm going to spend two minutes talking about data with hierarchical structures. And then because hierarchical models really shine when we are using a Bayesian approach, I'll spend some time just reviewing the very basics of Bayesian inference, not to give you like a full treatment of the topic, but just to help you to help us set up the notation that I'm going to be using for the rest of the talk. And having done that, um, I'll discuss the two popular approaches that people commonly use when modeling hierarchical data, and I'll put particular emphasis in their limitations. Then like to save the day, uh, that's when I will introduce you to hierarchical models, and I'll give you the intuition for them, I'll give you some examples, and I'll give you the code that you will need to implement them. So at the end of the talk, I'll give you a recap of all the points that we have covered and also dedicate some time to answer your questions. So if you have any questions, please just try them on the, on the chat and we'll get to those at the very end. Um, before I proceed, just uh, let me tell you that if you want to follow the slides at your own pace, all of those are available on my GitHub account. And also all the code that I'm going to be using, using is there available. I still need to make some updates to that code so that it's readable for you, but um, it should be ready this afternoon as well. OK, so what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Whenever we, whenever we start a new project, uh, we wish that our client will give us a, a large data set with mostly numerical features. But unfortunately, more, of, more often than not, we come to find that A, the data is not a lot of data, and B, it is played with categorical features. It's like the two nightmares of every data scientist. And big part of the work we do goes into figuring out what is the correct way of dealing with all of this non-numerical information, right? Typically, the solution that we end up with involves some form of encoding, like a set of rules for translating the categorical features into numbers so they can be fed into a machine learning model. We then test all of our ideas and decide for one ba based perhaps on some form of cross-validation. And then when we start a new project, we have to start from scratch because the method that we used last time for encoding might not be the ideal one for, for this different use case. So today, I'm going to teach you about hierarchical models, which is the correct framework for dealing with any sort of categorical features. And I dare to say now that you're thinking that hierarchical models should be appropriate for describing only hierarchical data, that is data that contains nested categories, like say states within a country. And after all, that's kind of what the name suggests. And you'd be right. In those cases, hierarchical models are the right answer, but they're also the right approach, even if the categories in your data do not form a nested structure, okay? So if you need to account for categorical features, nested or not nested, hierarchical models are, are the right approach. And, and that's good news. Now, I once heard my favorite writer say that no discussion should be carried out without examples. 
So following his advice, I'll move us away from the purely abstract by considering a very popular example in the literature. You will find it very easily on Google if you want to. And the example is commonly referred to the Radon in Minnesota case study. And uh, what is it? So what is it about? As you might know, Radon is a gas which is abundant in nature. It is everywhere and it's usually not a problem. However, high concentrations of radon can actually be detrimental to people's health. And unfortunately, sometimes houses are built nearby natural radon deposits, which of course poses a threat for the people living there. So in an attempt to identify the places at risk, some staff was designated to go all around the US measuring the concentrations of radon and uh, that were present in people's houses. And some of these measurements were carried out in the basement some were made on the, on the ground floor, and the county on which the measurement was made was also recorded. So what you're seeing here in the current slide are the measurements for the state of Minnesota only, almost 1,000 measurements, which is, you know, like it's an okay amount of data. Unfortunately, if we highlight the data that we have for each individual county, we immediately realize that in some counties we have very limited data, like this one, which we have only four measurements, or this other one that has only two measurements, not even on the same floor. And yes, some counties do have significant amount of data, but the problem is that many do not. And why is that a problem? Well, if we wanted to prioritize, like taking actions depending on which counties are more at risk, we will need to provide an estimate of how much radon there is in each county, right? And you know, you really shouldn't trust the statistics that were derived using two data points. So the problem is that given the data we have, how can we provide a reliable estimate of the radon levels in each county? An estimate that is somehow able to combine in a statistically rigorous way, the information available within a specific county, but also the information available for the whole state of Minnesota. So that's, that's what we're, where we are heading but before we get into the into the main part of the of the talk, we need to give a quick detour into Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference is a must when we are doing hierarchical models, so it will be important that we are on the same page here. Okay, so inference is all about understanding our data, right? Here I'm using the letter Y to denote my data, and given the data we have. The Bayesian approach starts by making an assumption about how, how such data could have been generated. We choose a, a family of probability distributions parameterized by, by some numbers, which here I, I've called theta. And this modeling assumption is called the likelihood function. The abstraction might seem unfamiliar to you, but I assure you it's nothing new. When, when you're making the decision of using, say, um, linear regression or logistic regression if you're doing classification or a neural network, the choice you're making at that stage, that is the likelihood. And theta would correspond to the coefficients of your linear regression or the weights of your neural network, etc. So in the machine learning community, the likelihood is commonly called uh, the model, but I'll refrain from using that terminology here because in the Bayesian approach, we understand that the likelihood is only a part of the problem, okay? So, and the likelihood is such that if we have enough data, it will kind of concentrate around the narrow region of parameter space, like pinning down the, the values of the parameters that could have generated the data we are seeing. If the data that we have is, is uh, not informative enough, however, the likelihood will be very diffuse, consistent with a wide range of parameter values. Okay, but the likelihood is only half the story. A distinguishing feature of Bayesian inference is that whatever prior knowledge we had about the parameters, that gets encoded into a probability distribution, which we call the prior. And again, a tight prior distribution reflects the fact that we have high confidence in our domain expertise when we can very confidently narrow down the possible, para the possible parameter values. And conversely, a diffuse prior, Y, reflects that like we have very poor domain expertise, so a wider range of parameter values are allowed. And Bayesian inference combines these two pieces of information 
so that by a Bayes theorem, we obtain what we call the posterior distribution. That is what we know about the parameters given our prior knowledge and the data we had collected. And you know, hopefully, hopefully it'll be the case that the posterior distribution has less variance than the prior distribution. So this is reflecting the fact that we have learned something in the process because the uncertainty after we have seen the data is less than the uncertainty we had before the data. But that doesn't always happen, uh, okay? Poor knowledge combined with poor data will of course lead you to poor inferences. That's just a fact of life. Um, but let me emphasize that obtaining the mathematical expression for this posterior distribution is not the ultimate goal of inferences, right? That is trivial. That's just like multiplying two functions and everyone can do that. What we really want is to use that distribution to perhaps take its average or maybe the quantiles, or perhaps we want to use that distribution to make predictions about future data. And all of those questions, answering all of those questions requires us to compute expectation values under the posterior distribution. And that's the, that's the really difficult part because expectation values involve taking integrals and you know, integrals are very difficult. Uh, in fact, if you're doing any modeling worth talking about, there's not just one parameter, but, but dozens of parameters or even hundreds of them. So the integrals that you will need to compute are very, very high dimensional, very untractable analytically. So instead of solving integrals exactly, we typically fall back on the famously known fact that any expectation you want uh, can be approximated by taking samples and sampling from an arbitrary distribution, regardless of its dimension, it's to a large extent a solved problem. The gold standard for doing for sampling is an algorithm called Markov Chain Monte Carlo or MCMC for short. And efficient versions of MCMC are already implemented in Python, perhaps in a bit too many libraries. The examples that I'll be showing you today and the ones that are available on my GitHub uh, are using NumPyro. Uh, but don't worry too much about the code implementation. I'm, I'm sure that even if you don't know NumPyro, you'll be able to follow the code very easily. Okay, so that's our speedrun of Bayesian inference. Let's now step back, step back in into, into our main topic, which is how are we going to model the categorical features? And I'll start, by, I'll start by showing you the two approaches that do not work. The first one is called complete pooling. In complete pooling, we take an overly simplified approach, which is just to ignore the categorical features. Just treat all groups as belonging to the same category using the same parameters for describing every single group. And I know that this already sounds like a horrible idea, but at least we are kind of overcoming the small data problem because everyone gets thrown in the same bucket. And I'm going to show you how this approach works in practice, but before I get to that, please let me clarify the notation that I'm using here. Um, I'm using Y to denote my data, like I said, and the subscript on that Y is being used here to enumerate the different observations. That's like the standard thing. So in my made up diagram uh, here, I have observations one and two belonging to group one, observations three, four, and five belonging to group two, and et cetera. But for this talk of today, I'm really not interested in keeping track of the individual observations. What I really care about are the, the groups to which these observations belong. So to avoid having many indices, I'm going to abandon the standard notation and instead uh, use a subscript to denote group membership. So my diagram will look like this. Um, it's not that I have less data, right? I'm just abbreviating and saying that y sub one are all observations made for group one, y sub two are all observations made for group two, etc. Okay, so going back to our textbook example, how would a complete pooling model look like in this case? Well, during the modeling phase, we simply forget about the fact that the data was gathered from different counties and we just see the data as belonging to Minnesota as a whole. And let's say that I'm going to choose to describe my data with a linear regression model, and that's my likelihood. It has three parameters. The first parameter alpha is the intercept term 
it tells me what is the average level of radon on the ground floor. The second parameter, beta, tells me what is the slope, so how much the level changes when I go from the basement to the, to the ground floor. And finally, there's this parameter, sigma, which measures how much noise there is in my data. And since I'm putting all of the counties in the same bucket, this parameter is kind of doing a lot of work, right? In a sense, the, difference from, the differences from one county to the next, any possible source of noise is, is getting drawn into this parameter. Um, okay, so that's the likelihood, but I'm doing Bayesian inference, remember? So I'm gonna need some priors on the parameters. And because I know very little about Radon and I know very little about Minnesota, I'm just going to choose priors that are fairly wide to reflect my ignorance. So I have alpha, I have a prior for alpha that is normally distributed around zero um, with five standard deviation. We are on the logarithmic scale, so that's really like something very, very wide. Okay, so those are my priors, but the question is, what is the posterior distribution, right? What can I say? Uh, can I say more about my parameters given the data that I, that I have seen? So we construct the posterior distribution by, by multiplying likelihood and priors, and then we can use Markov chain Monte Carlo to, to draw samples from that posterior distribution. And we can maybe take the mean of the posterior, etc. So I'll give you a, a, a very quick demo of how that works in NumPyro. The relevant part of your code will look something like this. You have some import statements uh, to get some helper function from NumPyro, like a sample function uh, and the densities that we're going to use in the model. And all of our model is going to be encoded in a function. And this function takes data as arguments. In this case, the only feature that is going into my model is the floor uh, on which the measurement was made, so basement or ground floor. And the log radon is my target variable, if you, if you like, that's, that's the measurements. The main body of the function contains a bunch of sample statements, and each sample statement is a multiplicative factor in, in base rule. Some of the sample statements correspond to the prior distribution for my parameters. And this, is, this sample statement is my likelihood function, where I'm saying that the observations of log radon are normally distributed around the given mean mu with some standard deviation sigma. And I'm doing linear regression so that mu is just given by a straight line with intercept alpha and slope beta. Um, but strictly speaking, like mu is not a new parameter, right? It's just a deterministic combination of parameters that I already had, alpha and beta. So this deterministic statement is just making that explicit. Okay, so once you have your model written in the form of a function, NumPyro has everything you need to run Markov chain Monte Carlo. You just have to create an instance of the MCMC class, passing your model as an argument, pack your data into a dictionary that then gets fed into, into the class, you just hit run and it's really that simple. You get the samples. So now that you have those samples, you compute whatever expectation you want. But let's just plot the samples in a histogram so that we understand what they look like. And you will see something like this. So our model had three parameters, remember? So we have three, mar three marginal distributions, one for alpha, one for beta, and one for sigma. And just from these histograms, we see that we've learned a lot, right? Uh, if you look at the alpha, uh, if you remember, my prior on alpha was a normal distribution centered at zero uh, with, with a standard deviation equal to five. But now what I'm seeing here is a posterior distribution centered around 0.7-ish, uh, with a standard deviation, I would say, around 0.1, roughly. That's like a 50 times less uncertainty than what I started with. And this is possible because I have so much data for Minnesota that it doesn't really matter if I started with a poor domain knowledge, my likelihood function is doing all the work, helping us to make good inferences. So when I combine the distributions of my intercept and the distribution of my slope, then I can get a distribution over the, over the line that goes from basement to ground floor. And, and it will look something like this when we put it in the context of the data we see that the mean radon level for Minnesota 
can be estimated very precisely. So just to be clear, the line that I'm showing you now is how well we can estimate the, the average radon level. And it, I'm, not, I'm not showing you the full posterior over the data, which would also include uh, the variance term sigma. The, the width of the purple line here, but which is almost hard to see, um, is just reflecting the fact that when it comes to the location of the mean, we have very little uncertainty about that. Okay, but having, a, having an accurate estimate for the, for the state of Minnesota can be very useless, right? Because when we are interested in the individual counties, describing each county with the same statewide average doesn't help me prioritize any specific county. The county on the top left looks a bit weird, right? The two measurements that I have are way above average, with, which looks dangerous, but my model is ignoring that. So I have a highly biased model, if you like. This brings me to my next approach, which is called a no pooling model. In a no pooling approach, what we do is favor the individual information we have about each group and just treat each group as independent from each other. So we end up with a separate model for each group, literally. And it's very easy to see how we do that in our example. Instead of having a single line for the whole state of, of Minnesota, I feed a separate line for the data in each county. So you, you have to be very careful here because the distinction from the complete pooling model and the no pooling model is all hidden in the indices of my parameters. But what I'm saying is that each county will get its own intercept term. Each county will get a different, a different slope, sorry, a different slope. And uh, you can also have a different noise term for each county if you, if you think that's the right thing to do. But in this case, I'm just going to assume that the amount of noise is the same in every county, just to keep things simple. And again, I need priors on my parameters. But given that I have no more information about any specific county, those are just names to me, uh, it makes sense that I use the same prior for everyone, right? Um, and how do I write the code for such a model? Well, again, the model is defined as a Python function that takes data as arguments. The key difference is that now the county on which the measurement was made is part of the information that is going to fit into my model. I'm also making use of this plate context manager provided by NumPyro so that instead of having a man to manually define a different alpha for each county, I just define these parameters inside of this context and NumPyro automatically turns this into a vector of parameters. Then when constructing the line that passes through the data, we just have to be careful of using the alpha and the beta that correspond to the county that I care about. Um, these are like, um, like the indices that I have on, on my likelihood. So what's gonna happen when I draw samples from this model? Well, before we had just one alpha and one beta and the variance, but now I have 87 alphas, one for each county, 87 betas, and I have also the variance term. So if I wanted to look at those, those will be like a lot of histograms to put on one slide. Um, so instead, I'm going to hand pick uh, 15 counties that I want to uh, focus on. And instead of looking at the histograms like face on, what we are doing here is that we are looking at the histograms from above. So that, that's two plots on, that you're seeing on the left where for each county, I am showing you the portion of the histogram that would correspond to like the 95% interval. And then on a slightly thicker black line, I'm showing you the 50% interval and that big white dot in the center is just the median. So in, what, in what's coming, I want you to pay special attention to this county right here, which happens to have an unusually high estimate for alpha, but it's also very uncertain. This is a county that only had two measurements. So when I combine the samples for alphas and the samples for betas, again, we get a distribution over the possible line that goes from basement to ground floor. And we see something like this. Now we have a different estimate line for each county and we might be okay with how those estimates look like for perhaps the two bottom plots. Um, but look at the uncertainty that I have on the, two, on the top two plots. In the top left plot in particular, my uncertainty is going from one to four and remember that this is on a logarithmic scale. 
Okay, so that's like three orders of magnitude. And fine, we now have bespoke inferences for each county, but some of these inferences are useless and because there's just too much uncertainty to them. So isn't there a way that we can capture uh, like the information from the other counties somehow, like share information across those groups? Uh, yes, there is, but that's what, that's what, that's what this is about. That brings me to the topic of hierarchical models. And there are many ways of thinking about hierarchical models, but my favorite way of introducing the topic is to first talk about a slightly broader concept, which is called partial pooling. Okay, so what is partial pooling? Well, we have these two approaches, complete pooling, where all the groups are modeled with the same parameters, and we have the no pooling, where each group is given its own set of parameters. And these parameters are completely independent from each other in this case. In partial pooling, we understand that these two options are not to two totally unrelated approaches, but rather we see them as the extremes of a continuum spectrum of modeling approaches. This continuum is obtained by introducing some amount of correlation between, between the group level parameters. And we can obtain some degree of correlation by first starting with the node pooling model where everything is independent. And with, then we introduce an extra set of parameters like latent parameters, whose job is not to describe the data anymore, but rather to describe the parameters themselves. And by the way, the diagram that you're seeing now on the screen, this is the reason why we call them hierarchical models. It's not because the data is hierarchical. It could be, but that's not the reason. The reason is that the parameters are hierarchical. We have parameters for the data, and then we are gonna introduce parameters for parameters. That, that's the reason for the name. So, okay, at this point, just like we had to make an assumption for the likelihood function, and just like we had to make an assumption for the prior, there's also an assumption here to be made about what latent model are we going to use. A popular choice, which is also friendly as a form of an introduction, is to use a Gaussian model, parameterized in terms of mean and its variance. So now the group parameters, the fetus, um, not only they have to fit the data, they also have to fit each other in, su in such a way that they accommodate to a normal distribution. If the variance of the latent model is chosen to be very large, we obtain a, basically a flat distribution which allows the parameters to be wherever they want. And if we choose a small variance, then the parameters are forced to be very close to each other. So let me show you how we, how we would write this down for our example. And, but for simplicity, let's say that for now, I'm just interested in introducing pooling for the, for the intercept term, for the alphas. And I'm going to forget about the betas for now. So like I said, we go back to our no pooling model where everything is independent from each other. And then we replace the prior on the alphas, on the alphas with a model for the alphas. And because I'm, I'm doing Bayesian inference, that just means that I need to introduce some priors on these new parameters that I've introduced. So I'm gonna have a prior for the mean um, and I don't know ar around which value the parameters are going to center. So my prior for the mean is going to be very wide. Uh, but instead of having a prior for, for the variance for the sigma alpha, I'm going to manually tell my model how much variance I want to have between the group parameters. Again, like the numpy code is quite simple. Um, it looks just like the no pooling model, uh, except that as an input to my model, I'm going to specify how much pooling I want to have. The intercepts of the counties are now given a model instead of just a prior. Um, so new parameters come into play. And that just means that I need to put some priors on these new parameters. So I can specify how much pooling I want, uh, a value, I give a value for sigma alpha, and then I can get samples from this model. And you would see something like this. So for now, let's just now focus on the, on the parameter alpha. I, I'll forget about beta, I'll forget about tau. Just let's look at the alphas. On the far left, I have the result for when I set the variance between the parameters to be zero. As expected, 
like all the groups end up being having the same estimates, which is equivalent to a complete pooling model, right? When when all param all counties were being described by the average Minnesota estimates. On the far right, if I let sigma alpha be equal to one, in this context, that's a very high value. Um, then I see that the group parameters can be very different from each other. And in fact, this is just exactly the same result that I got when I was doing the no pooling approach, allowing everything to be independent. And finally, I have this middle ground when I set uh, sigma alpha to be 0 0.5. So the parameters are now kind of similar to each other, but only slightly. And I no longer have like a wild estimate there, which is very, very high. So if you were to play this game for many values of sigma alpha and do these plots, you would end up with something like look like this plot here. So now I'm just showing you the mean. I've got rid of the I got I got rid of the the confidence interval, the credible interval thing because it will be too cluttered here. So I'm just showing you the mean of the alphas as I'm as I'm changing the amount of pooling in the model. So partial pooling allows me to learn from the data of the other counties and the amount of pooling that I that I choose tells my model how important the data from the other counties is. And I, I get to say if the other counties are super important, so I recover a complete pooling, or if the other counties are like irrelevant and I recover the no pooling approach. And just look at how my estimate for this county gets drastically regularized as I increase the pooling, right? Quickly joining the rest of the values. And a very cool feature is that the amount of pooling does not happen uniformly across my parameters. If you look at what's happening here, we see that there's the estimate for nobles, which starts to decrease immediately as I increase the pooling. But the estimate for Lake of the Woods stays kind of flat for a while and only really starts decreasing once the pooling has gotten strong enough. Um, this is happening because I had more data for Lake of the Woods than I did for Nobles. So my model just knows uh, how to take that into account. And that's great and all, but I think I, I think I know what you're thinking, which is how much pooling should we use, right? Before we had to decide between two approaches, complete or no pooling. Now I have an infinite number of options and I have to choose one amongst them. And that brings me to hierarchical modeling. And with everything that we've covered so far, it's going to be a very, very, a very easy jump. We want to use some amount of pooling perhaps, but the correct amount of pooling is kind of unknown to us. We don't want to pull the parameters if they don't want to be pulled. Uh, we just want to allow for that possibility, but we don't want to be imposing anything. So in the Bayesian, in the Bayesian viewpoint, unknown is just another word for parameter. And if we want to estimate a parameter, all we have to do is give a prior for it, show the data, and then let the magic of Markov chain Monte Carlo do its work to give us the estimate. So let's do that. So I take my partial pooling model and where I was given a, a specific value for sigma alpha, I now just put a prior on that. I have no idea what the right amount of pooling should be. So the prior that I have to choose is going to be very wide. In this case, I'm choosing an exponential distribution, which is covering a very wide range of values from zero to one, two, and even higher values. So I'm saying that all of those poolings are possible. I don't know which one. In my Python code, now this means that I will no longer have to specify by hand how much pooling I want to have. So that's no longer an argument in my function. Instead, I just give a prior for it and then proceed to run Markov chain Monte Carlo in the usual way. What comes out on the other side, once we get the samples, is just, it's really nice. Um, I get an estimate for the intercept that exhibits like a natural amount of pooling an amount of pooling that was not imposed by me, but it was learned from the data. And how much pooling? That's the histogram on the right. She's showing you my posterior distribution over sigma alpha, um, which is somewhere, which has its mean around 0 0.35, 0 0.4 perhaps. 
but I don't have to commit to any single value of sigma alpha, right? The Bayesian approach is already taking the average of all of these possibilities. So if we go back to, to the previous plot that we had here, what we've learned is that the right amount of pooling is somewhere in this blue region and Bayesian inference automatically takes the average of all those possibilities. So let's finally take a look at how this model behaves in the context of, of the actual data. If you want to, if you, I, I want you to pay special attention here to the, to the region that, that I have in, a, in the red circle, because that were, what, that's where the main action is happening. Um, we started with this complete pooling model, right? Which turned out to be useless because it's kind of ignoring the fact that the observation that I have here is way above average, okay? Um, so this is like a, a high, high bias model. Then we moved to a no pooling approach and we ended up with like overfitting basically because if we are told to fit a line and we are only given two data points, well, what else are we gonna do other than you know drawing a line that passes exactly through my two points? And the fact that in the context of the rest of the data, these two points are abnormally large, that's kind of irrelevant to me. I just feel a line that passes through those two points and that's my best estimate for the mean. However, we do recognize that with two points, our best estimate is not going to be a very good estimate. So we end up with this massive, massive uncertainty. Then we tried hierarchical model. And now we are not ignoring the individual data of each county, but I am also not overfitting because I can now share information across all counties. And I'm also obtaining more precise estimate for free. So let's look at it again. We have um, high bias, we have high variance, and we get this one, which is just right. And uh, you might be wondering why the uncertainty on the basement is still high. And that's because I'm not doing any pooling for the parameter beta for the slopes. So if you introduce a hierarchical model for the slopes, then you will be able to fix that uncertainty too. Okay, um, so that's hierarchical models. Let me now talk to you about something, um, about how you incorporate group level information. Um, so what am I talking about? If you're one of the lucky ones, your client might come to you and say, hey, I actually have more data in this other file. And then it turns out that the data you're shown is not of the same data, but it's actually some other file with information about the categories that were in this other file. And this, this new data set is, is a lot smaller, of course. Uh, for example, in the, in, the Radon, in the Radon case study, we actually know what the abundance of uranium is in each county. So that's kind of like an extra piece of information we might use. So you think to yourself, hey, that might be useful. So you proceed to do a merge of the tables and then just chuck everything into your extra boost, right? Well, that's a mistake. Um, this new data that you've just been given is not data about the radon measurements, it's data about your groups. And those two pieces of information live in two entirely different levels. Your model should somehow take that into account. And with hierarchical models, doing that is really super simple. Because what you can do is that you go back to the part of your model that was describing the intercepts, for instance, and you turn that into a regression model itself, like a linear regression, for example, where now I'm using the uranium, uranium abundance as a predictor, that's like the U here. And this linear regression is a bit mysterious, okay? It's like, it's all happening on parameter space. Uh, so this model does not directly talk to the radon measurements. It's, some, it's somehow hidden from us but it is allowing for information to be shared across the different groups in a way that the data that we have is being incorporated at the, at the right level. And I will no longer bother you with the code. That's like the easy part. Let's just, let's just jump straight into the results. Here's what the results would look like in the complete pooling model. So I'm showing you now the, the Radon estimates, the alpha for all counties, uh, but now, 
plotted against the abundance of urani uranium in that county. In the complete pooling model, where we treated every county as equal, and we made no attempt to incorporate uranium levels, the estimates would end up look something, looking something like this, just all the same. Second, we have the no pooling approach, where each county was given its own estimate, right? Um, we ignored the data from the other counties. We also didn't include any information about uranium. So we ended up with something like the plot here, which has like very uncontrolled variation from county to county. And um, perhaps if you stare at this for long enough, maybe you will be able to distinguish a slight correlation between uranium and radon. Uh, but if there's really a correlation there, our model at this stage was not making any attempt to capture that. Then we introduced hierarchical modeling as a way to sharing information between groups and also controlling our estimates. Look at that reduction in variance, by the way. It's like uncontrolled, controlled. Um, but again, no information about uranium was included at this stage, right? So our model cannot really resolve any obvious correlations. Then when we include the uranium data, look at what happens. Now, not only am I controlling my inferences, like not only am I sharing information between counties, but having this deeper understanding of the structure in the data allows me to make very, very accurate inferences. By being very careful about my modeling approach, I'm able to really squeeze every drop of information out of my data and look at the uncertainty bars in the, in the estimates. All of the counties basically have the same uncertainty. That's like very, very powerful. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that hierarchical models are the right approach whenever you have to deal with categorical information because it allows you to share information between groups, it prevents you from overfitting to a small data set, and it seamlessly incorporates the different data sources to the, at the right level. However, before you decide that you most definitely want to jump on this train, I feel like I have to give you a few words of warning. Uh, first of all, you have to be careful about prepackaged software that claims to do claim to do hierarchical models for you, which work by simply doing maximum likelihood estimates. Maximum likelihood doesn't really work with hierarchical models unless you are doing some other heavy assumptions on top. And in prepacked software, those assumptions will be hidden from you, so you won't be able to question them. Um, so if you want to get it right, you will need a Bayesian approach, and Bayesian modeling is just difficult, especially in hierarchical, in hierarchical models where the complexity can quickly get out of control. If you think of the pooling that we were introducing for the alphas, you can imagine that now you also introduce pooling for the betas. Maybe you allow for different variants from county to county. You incorporate uranium, uranium for each of these parameters. Then you can further introduce correlations between alphas and betas. Uh, it quickly gets very overwhelming, even for this very simple example. And the mathematical aspect of that is really just half the problem. It's often the easy part, because to make Markov chain Monte Carlo work efficiently, so that you don't have to wait days, uh, you will often have to parameterize your model in some very, very specific ways. And knowing the right parameterization, um, unfortunately, is something that just comes with experience. All that being said, um, I still recommend you jump on the train. Hierarchical models are such a powerful technique to have in your toolkit. And once you learn them, uh, you will really see the opportunity to use them everywhere. Yeah, so trust me. Um, OK, um, that's it for the, for the main part of the talk. Let's just now uh, spend a few minutes answering your questions. So let me try to bring the Q&A here. Um, can you please share your GitHub link? I guess I could have read that at the very start of the talk. Um, uh, we will also be sending you the GitHub link um, via email. So just make sure that if you regis register for the talk, I'll be sharing you with that one with you uh, later. So it was, um, no, that's the one. Is there a reason you didn't standardize the data to uh, having a standard normal distribution um, before the first complaint pooling model, or is it just for brevity in your presentation? 
um, standardizing your data can definitely um, can definitely improve the performance of your of your model, make it make your algorithm more efficient. But you don't always have to. Uh, sometimes it's a must. Uh, like if you're doing like a Gaussian process, perhaps, and if you don't standardize, things are going to go very wrong. But in this simple example, I didn't have to bother with the standardizing. It was just too simple. Um, so I have another question that says, can you tell us a, a little bit more about your prior for one over sigma being a gamma distribution? Uh, right, let me bring that, that slide uh, here. Uh, uh, and this one, I guess, where the sigma is given an inverse gamma distribution. So uh, yeah, the, the notation is a bit weird. I just mean sigma is distributed like an inverse gamma. Uh, the reason I do that is because an inverse gamma distribution doesn't have any support at zero. So I'm saying that I know there is some variance. So the variance in my data is not zero. But what I want to say is like, I don't know how large it can be. The inverse gamma distribution has a really, really fat right tail, which allows for very high values if the data really wants to be very noisy. That's the reason for that prior. Um, I have another question that says, out of interest, what made you choose NumPyro over Stan, PyMC3? Um, I never heard of NumPyro, but before I used to Stan, and I'm wondering what the difference are. Um, the reason we choose NumPyro NumPyro is now the, the default choice here at the faculty. We kind of, we actually had meetings and analyzed all the different libraries and just eventually decided that NumPyro was the more suitable for the kind of work that we want to do. NumPyro has a nice um, interfaces for doing MCMC and also for doing um, variational base if you want to do other kinds of Bayesian inference. And as opposed to something like Stan, for in, Stan is very nice, but you can only do MCMC. And the problem with Stan for us was that Stan relies on C++. So you need to have a C++ compiler. And whenever you're deploying a Bayesian model, it just gets very, uh, very hard and very tricky engineering going on. So NumPyro is just, it's all based in Python uh, and it's very powerful. So that's what we choose it basically. Um, I have another question that says, how sensitive is the amount of pooling to the prior that you have? So I'm, I'm guessing this question is like, um, if I change the, the prior of an exponential one to something different, is that going to affect the, the answer? The, the short answer is that yes, it will affect your answer, but it's really not that sensible. You'd be surprised that the posterior that you get after is just, just indistinguishable from what you had before. As long as you have a, um, a prior that is not like highly informative, you know, like definitely suppressing some values, um, you, will, you will always end up with like distributions that look very similar. Of course, that, 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 this depends on the data, but most of the time that, that's the case. Um, nice, I have, uh, I think I'll take a, one last question which says that, do you always need to assume that a single amount of pooling uh, is the right for all groups? Might you have sometimes many pooling parameters for predefined group sets? Um, single amount of pooling for all groups. Mm, I am not sure that I'm understanding here. Um, so the pooling is something that happens across groups. Uh, and I think that you are saying that maybe you want to pull closer some groups and the others not pull them such as close. Um, if I'm understanding right, that's because you maybe have some other information about, about that distinguishes the type of group that you have. Like, um, like in this case, a uranium, or maybe you have some other geographical information about the places. So they can, you have some extra information. And the short answer is then, no, you can definitely pull separately the different groups that you have. But that means that you have to build a slightly more complex structure. 
but I think the framework uh, still still works out. Um, okay. Um, let me. Uh, I think we have time for one more, so let me just find one, which is nice. Um, I have here a question that says, "Do you always need to use MCMC?" I recently read about variational inference, and apparently this is quicker for big data with more simplistic calculations. That is right. So Markov chain Monte Carlo is a is a very popular choice because. In a sense, you have some theorems that tells you that Markov chain Monte Carlo, if you get enough samples, is going to converge to the right answer. The disadvantage of Markov chain Monte Carlo is that it is very slow, uh, especially in hierarchical models. So you might want to be looking for some other alternatives that do variational inference in a quicker way. One of those is like variational base. Um, which is a very popular one. It's just like kind of approximating your distributions with other friendlier distributions that you can easily sample from. Um, I think the problem with variational inference is that it is not guaranteed to converge to the right answer. So sometimes if your model is well behaved, um, you can just get away with doing variational inference, which is going to be quicker, but you had no way of knowing if, if you are getting the right answer. So that's always the, it's always the spine of like, you have the answer, but is this right? And then just to confirm that you're right, maybe what people do is like, you also run MCMC once just to um, get some peace of mind that variational base and MCMC are giving you the same answer. Um, but so yeah, then you have to run MCMC again and that kind of, kind of defeats the purpose. Um, but variational base is, is very cool. If you manage to like tune it well, and and have a fairly simple model, then I think it's a good way. It's a, definitely a good option. Um, okay, so there are, there are many more questions, but I don't think we have time to go through all of them. So what I'm going to do is just the same as last time, where um, I'm just going to keep a log of the questions, and I will send you back a full fully detailed answer to all of your questions via an email. And I'll also make sure to share that GitHub link on the email as well. Cool. So thank you, everyone, for, for joining me. Uh, have a nice rest of the day.